Ephesians chapter 6, and beginning at verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour and their eyes on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly, as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favouritism with him. Let me pray as we look through this. Father, we do need your spirit working in us. We need the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Help us as we think through these verses. Speak to us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And what difference does being a Christian make to how we work and how we manage our work? And more specifically, following the flow of Ephesians, what difference does Jesus being Lord make in our work life? And Paul says in chapter 1, Jesus was raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realms. He is enthroned. He is Lord. And as we saw, that same resurrection power is at work today, or chapter 2, in Christians, making us alive and raised and seating them in and through Christ. And that changes everything. It changes who we are. It changes our identity. It changes how we are. And so this morning in chapter 6, how does it affect how we work? What impact does it have on um, how much time I spend on work? On how invested I am in it? And how I treat my bosses and employees? Or more widely, and those with whom I'm in some kind of relationship through some kind of work, and maybe volunteer, and maybe through school. And, and you might be thinking, well, it doesn't. Here's my church life over here, and my work life over here, and they do not overlap. And total separation of church and work. And in fact, even if you do not think that, we might accidentally live out that way. We might live as if it has no impact. And see, the Ephesians were in a society in many ways not dissimilar from our own. And they may well have been tempted to think or act just like that. God has this part of my life, and work has this part of my life. And well, Paul leaves them in no doubt of the truth. And the letter to the Ephesians is all about identity formation. He wants them and us to know who we are, a new creation in Christ, and what we have in Jesus. And Paul has gone to great lengths to show that. Um, if you're relatively new this morning, um, let me say everything um, that we've seen so far in Ephesians should all be up on the website. Um, it is a wonderful letter, it's so encouraging. Um, so let me thoroughly recommend going back and having a listen particularly the first half, as he spells out some of these truths. But then this morning, in the second half, as Paul then looks at what that looks like in practice, what being in Christ looks like as we come to the topic of labour, and labour for the Lord. And now, when I chose the title for this sermon, this was a while ago, this was long before a general election was even called, uh, let alone a new government. Um, so uh, let me just start off by saying, um, this is not a political sermon in that sense. I'm not starting a new a lobby group alongside kind of Labour youth. It's Labour for the Lord. Um, though I'm sure that'd be a wonderful group to have. Um, that is not what we're doing. Um, but this morning we are talking about um, work and more generally kind of labour in anything. Or working hard at whatever it may be. And work status, what our role is, who work for us, who we work for, are we self-employed, are we retired, working at a hobby, what we do with our time, that is for us, and for the Ephesians, so defining of who we are in our society. 
and even the idea of career, giving yourself fully to your job, what your legacy is, and that is a pervasive and universal idea. But it's not a very Christian idea. Paul says that's topsy-turvy. Our identity is in Christ. We are Christian, and so that changes how we do everything, including our work, whatever that work is. Work doesn't define my identity. My identity defines how I work. That's the right way around. I and mean, that is what we see in these verses, that whatever I labour in, my identity changes how I work. And, and we'll see both sides of the coins. For workers and for bosses, workers labour for the Lord with wholehearted obedience. And bosses labour for the Lord with wholehearted humility. Workers labour for the Lord with wholehearted obedience. And bosses labour for the Lord with wholehearted humility. So firstly then, workers labour for the Lord with wholehearted obedience. Verse 9, slaves, obey your earthly masters. And before we go any further, let's address the giant elephant that I have left standing in the room so far. Hang on, James, Paul doesn't say workers. He says slaves. Uh, now, we are going to have a, a midweek topic spotlight on this um, in the autumn term. Um, so we'll be thinking about this a bit more then. So if you don't cover everything, don't worry, we can come back then. Um, and chat to me afterwards. I'm happy to keep going through this. Uh, but the first thing I think we're saying is that first century Greco-Roman um, slavery that Paul is talking about, if you just do any level of base research into it, is for the most part not at all the same thing as modern slavery. And the owning of people as property and the abhorrent modern slavery practice. And that is not generally what Paul is speaking into. And the ESV translates it as um, bond servants, and people that um, give a certain amount of their, of their time. They bond to someone in return for a wage, a room for board, food. Um, it's maybe um, a little bit like maybe a full-time au pair, you know what they are. Um, someone's kind of come and help around the house and live there often from a kind of foreign country. Um, and they, they, they live with you and they, and they help and they um, cook and they clean and turn for room and food and a little bit of money. Um, now that is not to say that there weren't some horrific examples at the time, but for the most part, that is more what Paul is speaking into. Um, but secondly, I really want to emphasise that the Bible is not pro-slavery. And Paul explicitly say um, in his first recorded letter to the Corinthians in chapter 7, um, so here in Ephesians, you might think, we'll be better off just saying, instead of all of this, get rid of slavery. And well, we need to remember that Paul is writing to a small, relatively uninfluential group of people. Paul is not writing to society. He's writing to the Ephesian Christians. And so it's one of them something, hang on, this is my only means of food in a room. This is actually how I get a good quality of life. <laughs> And they might be thinking, well, what could we do about that? And, but more importantly, that is not how Paul thinks. And that's not his worldview, his theology. It is bigger than that. And the second half of the letter, where he is very practical, is built on everything in the first. The gospel is what transforms lives, not commands. And transformed lives are then what can affect society. The Bible's theology is that the good news about Jesus changes people's identities, and those changed hearts mean they live a different way. And then as more people come in, that can affect change more widely. And that was well, that was right. Paul was on the right side of history, as it were. And as the growth of Christians in the first century. And went up, and the use of slavery went down. And that was no coincidence. And the people behind the abolition of slavery, people like William Wilberforce, started from a belief that all people are equal under God. The gospel is not compatible with non slavery, not even at all. But the gospel transforms people directly 
and so society indirectly. You have to see it that way around. And now that might all feel like a distraction, um, but one that I do think is necessary to cover so that we can all focus on what Paul really does say without the distraction. And what does he say? Getting back to our topic, workers, obey your earthly masters. And workers have a new identity and recognition that Jesus is Lord, and so live it out. I and mean, that looks like obedience to earthly masters, or, or actually more literally, to earthly lords. It's that word, kirios. You treat your masters, your boss, well, actually in a small way, as you would Jesus. And that is the picture in these three verses. And I think that's backed up by and explains the way they are to do it. And Paul says, with respect and fear. And again, more literally, with fear and trembling. And hopefully your Old Testament alarms go off there. And fear and trembling is how we are to be with God. In places like Psalm 2, fear and trembling. And so I don't think Paul is saying, be afraid of your boss. But I think it's far more radical and far more freeing than that. He said, obey them as you would Jesus. Which Paul then says explicitly at the end of verse 5, just as you would obey Christ and treat those that have been given authority over you as you do to heavenly authority. And when they ask for the report in by Monday, it's in by Monday. And when they need your help on something, you help. Because it's like Jesus has asked for help. And when they ask you not to do something, you don't do it. And it's not half-heartedly, and you obey them with sincerity of heart. I think that idea is um, unpacked a bit more in verse 6. Don't just give them eye service, give them full service. And whether they're watching you or not, what you hand in, and what you do needs to be more than just the bare minimum. How often do we hand in the bare minimum? No, work hard as you work for Jesus. It's of cosmic significance. And I do think it um, similarly applies to school children. And work hard at school. Your homework that you hand in shouldn't just be what you can get away with. Work as you would for Jesus. Because remember who you really work for, verse 6. You work for Jesus. You are, in fact, slaves of Christ, bound to him. And that's why I think it's helpful that the NIV has it translated as bond servants. It's because Paul is interested in saying who we really are slaves of, who we really belong to and work for. It is a strong relationship. We are his, and we are freed from sin and slaves to righteousness. We are Christ. Our identity is in him. And so when we work, whatever that work, we do the will of God. It's presumably even easier to remember who you really work for if you're self-employed. But for all of us, Paul says, well, you're on, you're on secondment. And your paycheck may have the name of um, your company, but you really work for the king. And if you remember back to uh, chapter one, we thought about, imagine if King Charles had come to the orphanage and chosen you, adopted you. And we thought that was pretty amazing. Well, now to further the illustration, we're now on assignment for him. On secondment, working somewhere else. When you get your new job, work in the cash register, King Charles calls you over. No, brilliant. <laughs> I am delighted to offer you this role, and what I expect from you is to give me your best. But remember who you really work for. And it's not Jeff Bezos packing parcels, it's me, King. Okay. Who you really work for is the King. And the one on the throne, and not the one in Buckingham Palace, wherever he is at the moment, but in heaven. Jesus is your real boss. So in verse 7, serve wholeheartedly, as if you were serving the Lord, not people. That is why we work hard. That's why we bust it out. Who we're working for. 
And of course, it really is transformative. And that's transformative for how we work. And for most people, what they do for work um, doesn't really matter that much, actually, if you look at some of the surveys, at least not as much, as who you work with or for. Um, our, our work occupies such a huge amount of our time, and so our work relationships basically make or break a job. A breakdown in that relationship can make it really, really, really difficult. I mean, getting up for work in the morning is horrible. And that can be the difference between delight and depression, ecstasy and exasperation in your day. Well, it turns out our most important work relationship is with King Jesus. And he's our real boss. He's the one we really need to please. He's the one we get up and work for. We work with wholehearted obedience, whatever we do, closing sales at a bank or closing the doors in the little shop because we labour for the Lord. He's our real master. And if that wasn't encouraging enough, what I really want to push us to see is remember the context in Ephesians. We are one new creation. And turn back with me to chapter 2 and verse 10. We should also have the verse on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, or in fact creation, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And remember, we are a new um, Adam, and so that affects our family like we've just seen. And like we saw at the end of chapter 5, and at the beginning of the start of 6, we're a new creation family. And you were Adam and Eve, going forth and multiplying, spreading the knowledge of the glory of God. And but this time one made right in Christ. So we are godly husbands and wives, and parents and children. But also we are a new creation, in chapter 2 verse 10, and 6 verse 5 to 9, that is, working the garden. And Paul alludes back to Genesis 2 in verse 15, where Adam is commanded to work and keep the garden. Now, let me read that for us. It should also be on the screen. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. What we're seeing here in these verses is how we fulfill the creation mandate. This really is of cosmic significance. The universe is watching. That is huge. Do you see the encouragement? Paul is not beating the Ephesians around the head and said, why haven't you been doing things like this? Why haven't you been working that hard? But rather he's showing who we are and exhorting us to live that out. And who we are is profound. We're a new creation with garden work. And so when you're getting ready for, for work in the morning, you've got your like, keys, wallet, phone, probably your pass, and then whatever else you take to work, your laptop. Well, here's your new work equipment. Don't forget your trowel and your fork. And because wherever you go, we are working in God's garden. We are doing creation garden work. And that is why and it really doesn't matter what I do for work. It doesn't matter if I fulfil my potential. And Jesus didn't transform the Judean carpentry centre. And Paul didn't revolutionise tent making. What matters is who I am and how I do my work. And we're told nothing on what job to do. The Bible just doesn't tell us. But it tells us everything on how to do it. We work wholeheartedly, obedient, because we're a new creation. And so if our work is transformed, because we are transformed, it really will look different. It will mean I don't steal even a paper clip. It will mean I don't gossip, even if the Monday morning meetings in your team um, is basically an invitation to do so. And I had Mondays like that. And it will mean saying sorry sometimes. 
And how frequently do we hear the word sorry at work? It will mean I'm honest with my time, I mean, even if nobody is watching me. Because my real Lord is watching me. At school, it means I do my homework on time, I and mean, I don't lie about it. Um, I remember, um, I think I must, I must have been put up to it by a friend. Um, but deciding to get a bit creative with my excuse for my DT homework, um, I said, I'm sorry, sir, my gecko ate my homework. <laughs> um, I had a pet gecko, which is, if you don't know what a gecko is, it's basically like a small lizard. Um, it was quite a cool um, animal. Um, but I thought, you know, a puppy's a bit too original, as, uh, unoriginal as far as excuses go. Um, and my, te my teacher was so baffled by the audacity. Um, he, just, he just chuckled and let it go. So I got away with that one. Um, but that was, that was wrong with me. Um, I should have been honest. In fact, I should have just done it in the first place. And simply in the workplace, working like this can be really hard. Especially when our earthly boss is difficult. Sometimes transformed working will make us really unpopular. I was checking with Effie during the week, and um, sometimes this looks like being kind and loving to a boss that really doesn't deserve it. And as well as being hard, that can, that can be really unpleasant for your colleagues. Why are you being nice to them? Because that makes it harder for us. You're showing us up. I mean, what a transformed way to live. Well, because we're really working for Jesus. And so we work wholeheartedly to please him. And as I said, I think it applies quite broadly to anything we're working on. Whatever it is, we're working wholeheartedly for Jesus. And, and I think knowing who we really work for also answers the question, what if my boss tells me to do something wrong? What if he asks me to do something the Bible says is not a good thing to do? Well, I think we know the answer to that. We really work for Jesus. I and mean, that can be really costly. And this will probably embarrass him. But my grandfather used to work, and he sits at the back there, he used to work for his family. I and mean, they were non-Christians when he was much younger. And when he became a Christian, and there was a business practice and that the family did that he said, I can't do that anymore. And in fact, I won't do it, and neither should you. And so he was fired by his family. That took integrity. And that took knowing who's really Lord. No, we really work for Jesus, King Jesus. And verse 8, his remuneration package and bonus package well, it's out of this world. And the Lord will reward each of us for whatever good we do, whether slave or free. And this is the motivation for workers and for bosses, free. Jesus will reward us all. And I think it's the hinge between our two groups, for slaves and masters, slave or free. And so secondly, and but far more briefly, and particularly as we've covered the big picture of being in your creation. Secondly, bosses labour for the Lord with wholehearted humility. Verse 9, masters likewise treat your slaves, those in work type relationships with you, in the same way. And that doesn't mean um, obedience, that obviously wouldn't quite work, but rather I think it means similarly realising that you are also part of new creation, working for God. We're all working for King Jesus. And say verse 9, don't threaten them. And threatening is usually something in the Bible that non-Christians do to Christians. Bosses, don't threaten your workers. That's what the pagans do. You're Christians. You treat your workers, your students, your volunteers, whomever, with value, with dignity, with respect. And they're people, not objects. People with inherent value. A value that you should humbly recognise. 
because we all belong to one master. Again, that same word for Lord, one Lord. And so however our work life looks, whether employed or managing employees, we realise there's always a bigger boss. The Lord, if we haven't said it enough. A worker or employer, teacher or student, whatever the relationship, Jesus is Lord, not you. Maybe you run a club and you've got volunteers. Be Christ-like with them. I'm not demanding and threatening. Because you're not the real Lord. That's Jesus in verse 9. He does not show favouritism. Your job status does not determine your worth or value. And it shouldn't in the eyes of humans, because it doesn't in the eyes of God. He doesn't prefer masters to slaves, bosses to workers. And imagine a sixth form prefect threatening a year seven because then bow to them or something stupid like that. And the headmaster's there watching. A manager threatening an employee with a formal written warning because the tea they made them wasn't the perfect temperature. And the CEO is right there watching it unfold. If you are in any kind of position of authority, you have been put there by God. Do not abuse it. Do not threaten them. But rather show them the love of Christ. <coughs> and even when they are doing your nuts, and employees can be the worst, can't they? Lazy, arrogant, ungrateful, back talking, backbiting, you name it. I mean, hopefully, not the Christians, but irrelevant. It doesn't matter how they are. You are a new creation, and so you live like it, even if they don't. Show the Lordship of Christ. Display it to them. Humbly see that Jesus is Lord of you both. And so as you both labour together, labour for the Lord, them in wholehearted obedience, you in wholehearted humility, and we know he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, on the throne. So as we close, I really want to encourage us in all of our work to see the big picture, the cosmic significance. Work fits into our identity as a new creation. Garden work. We are in Christ. And if we know that, really know that, it will mean living a transformed life when it comes to how I labour. Because ultimately I work for Jesus. I labour for the Lord. Knowing that, really knowing that in my heart, that changes me. The engine room for how I behave is knowing who I am in Christ. And that's, as we saw, Paul's prayer, the Ephesians will grasp in chapter 1. Wisdom and revelation about what Christ has done in them. And that means whatever side of the working relationship that I am on, I work wholeheartedly in either obedience or humility as we all labour for the Lord. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you help each of us to recognise the great cosmic significance to what may seem insignificant in how we work. Lord, we pray that you help each of us to see that Jesus being Lord actually really impacts us. But not in a way that should make us feel discouraged, but in a way that encourages us that living this out, looks like being a new creation. It looks like fulfilling what it should have been in the Garden of Eden. May we recognise the, the wonder that that is and praise Christ as Lord that you sent him to die and be raised and seated on the throne in a way that takes us with him. He did that for his glory, and we praise you for it. But he also did it for us, and we praise you for that. 
And so as we go into all kinds of work environments, Lord, help us all to live out those truths. And if we're not a believer here this morning, may we really come to see the good news of Jesus is good for all aspects of life. We pray all of this in our precious Saviour Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen.